Hello, everybody. I'm Lucas Kendall. This is my co-host, Charlie Vignola. And we have our first special guest, Fred Decker, for our first ever guest on our show. And Fred, this is, this is how we do it. We just go right into it. <laughs> No, but we should say, so we, wait, 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 he's a special guest, so should we should introduce you, him. We so should Fred introduce is the him, yes. Writer, director of uh, Night of the Creeps, Monster Squad, uh, more recently, uh, co writer of Predator. What's the, the Predator? The Predator. The, the Predator. Don't forget the article. Um, yeah. Uh, so Lucas and I are, are, are longtime friends of Fred's, and this is very nice of him to do. Um, Lucas, how did you how did you meet Fred originally? From Shane Black's house. Okay, that's kind of how I met him. Well, you go first because your story goes back to what the eighties. Okay, yeah, eighty seven. The the, okay. the actually right after the summer that um, a movie Fred wrote and directed uh, and and co wrote with his friend Shane Black called Monster Squad came out in the summer of of eighty seven. I originally found out about the movie uh, through Starlog, which was a magazine I think we all really enjoyed in the late 80s and, and had a lot of news about um, movies and television in the sci-fi, fantasy, and horror genre. So I nerds read an article. Nerds is the word he's looking for, nerds. Yeah, yeah. Well, before nerds were kind of like cool. Um, and and there was an article. I remember I was at a newsstand and there was an article. Uh, must have been an interview with you, Fred. And it was just describing the movie and I remember the way they described it in the article was it was Stand By Me meets Ghostbusters is the way they did in the Star Trek, uh, in the Starlog article. And you, I've heard uh, more like Little Rascals meets the Universal Monsters. So six of one, half a dozen of the other. Um, but I think for modern audiences, it's Stranger Things 1987, right? Uh, young kids in a small town who realize that there's a threat nobody else realizes and have to band together and join forces to to save their town and their family and friends from this horrible supernatural threat. By the way, season four of Stranger Things is actually stealing shots from Monster Squad. Ah, I'm sure it's an homage. I'm sure not, they're not stealing any. No, but, big, um, fan. big fan. But, but the funny story, and this is, I, I think this is a good lesson for anybody who needs to figure out, like, how do you make connections when you have no connections? So I read about the article when the movie came out. I saw the movie uh, in the summer of 87. I got a big kick out of it, really enjoyed it. I'm a, I'm a junior in college at University of Miami. So I don't know why, but I had it in my head. Uh, I read in the article, you're a young filmmaker. And, uh, you know, um, I said, boy, it would be really great if I can somehow get this guy to come out and screen his movie on the campus at University of Miami. And I was a um, part of the film club there. So I, I didn't even, we had no internet. So I didn't know how, to, how am I going to get in contact with, I didn't even know you know, he, he, does he have an agent? Who's the agent? How do I do all that? Somehow I figured it out. Somehow I figured out, Fred, who your representative was and called them. And again, you know, just some kid at, at a college asking, uh, like, I know this is a long shot. We don't even have any money to get him here, but it would be great um, uh, if he could come and screen the movie. I don't know how again, but somehow the, the request got to you and you were like very gracious to say, yeah, I'll come to the University of Miami for, for a couple of days and screen the movie. And I, I remember like sharing the news with my friends at the school who were all just like, how did you, what, oh my God, this is so cool. So we knew Fred was coming. We got a print of the movie. And I remember like as the night of the screening was, was, was close, uh, Fred was like, so, you know, the movie's anamorphic. We shot the movie anamorphic. I, yeah, I'm assuming you guys have an anamorphic lens. <laughs> like, uh, no. What? Uh, what's an anamorphic? What's an anamorphic lens? It was terrifying, and we're just like, it, I think it was like an hour, hour and a half before the movie, and it was like, you know, full tilt craziness running around the campus <laughs> trying to see if anybody had an anamorphic lens, and thank God we found one, and you know, breathed a sigh of relief, and. It, the screening went great. Uh, people really enjoyed the film. You know, I mean, not a lot of people had seen it, even though it had just come out over the summer, but they really connected to it. Fred did a great q and It was so much fun. We, we had dinner afterwards. So as a, again, young kid who wanted to work in the film business and having no connections whatsoever, I was like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be moving out after college, after my senior year. You were really nice and gave me your phone number and said, you know, when you come out, give me a call. So year passed, moved out, loaded my car, drove to Beverly, 
and uh, it's so it's a, a year later, summer of 88, I believe. And um, I called you up, Fred, and you were like, oh, we're having a party at this house in Veteran, uh, a bunch of our friends. Uh, you want to come? I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. That, that would be awesome. And so, you know, you were nice enough to invite me. And I, I at the party, I had the pleasure to meet many of your friends. Uh, uh, Dave and Arnott and uh, Ryan Rowe and Shane Black and, you know, uh, Jay Cappy, uh, a small uh, close-knit group of uh, young screenwriters who at the time had, had called themselves the Pado Guys, which uh, there was an article in Premier Magazine, another magazine you guys won't remember, but it was a great new magazine about the film business, big, slick, and glossy. And it was like, boy, that's the dream, isn't it? It's, it's these guys but living the dream. And so uh, I remember on top of that, it was the, you, you and Shane were working on Shadow Company at the time. Yep. And you had a trailer up at Universal. That's right, right and, next door to Sam Raimi and Rob Tapper. And you were, again, very nice. Like, hey, would you like to come to Universal? And, and yeah, you, we, we, I, I came and I visited. And, and uh, again, just how nice you were to some dumb kid out of college who didn't know what the hell he was doing. And, but it was through meeting you that I met Shane and, and my friend Doug Amaturo and, and sometimes writing partner met you and Shane. And through Shane, we met Sue Smith. And through, through Sue Smith, she was nice enough to read, uh, you know, one of our early efforts, one of our screenplays, who, and she got it to United Talent Agency to a young uh, agent named John Lesher, who became my first agent, and fun fact, went on to win an Oscar <laughs> for, for producing Birdman many, many years later. Wow. So it's just like a, a really interesting story about just, you know, again, so much of this business is incredibly random, and you got to put yourself out there because you never know where these connections are going to lead. You, you can have expectations, but at the end of the day, you don't really know. And that's just the roundabout story of like, yeah, how I met Fred and, and how uh, I got my first, my first script sold and my first agent. And thank you, Fred. You're, you know, years later, appreciate you being the first domino to help on that, on that whole thing. It's so. a great story because it, it, it's so true. Sometimes the way to get what you want is to just ask. Mm -hmm. People say, yeah. oh, okay. They're sort of taken aback sometimes. And, it, and it's a... I, it's a trick to ask the right way, Lucas, right? Because if you don't ask the right yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking that. So first of all, I want to tell my story. You know, what about me? So I met Fred because I was publishing Film Score Monthly. I did that at college. I finished college at the end in 96. And I came out to LA in October 96. And one of my subscribers was Bob Renault, another one of the Paddock guys. Uh, who He uh, co-wrote or wrote Action Jackson and also co-wrote Demolition Man. And he's a huge, huge soundtrack collector and, and a super sweet guy. So when I moved here, I didn't know anybody. Well, I knew a lot of people, but um, they weren't like people I could be friends with because a lot of them, were, they had families and they were like, I, it didn't help that I knew Danny Elfman. It wasn't really gonna, you know, I wasn't gonna go to Danny Elfman's house. Um, <laughs> Who ironically but, lives next door to Shane. Well, not anymore. I think he moved, right? Yeah. You're out of date. But uh, <laughs> yeah, Bill Conti does, all right? I, don't know. I didn't know that. Yeah, they used to see Bill Conti all the time in Hancock okay. Park. So uh, Bob and, uh, said, why don't you come over? We're having this pizza night and you can meet my friends, you know, Shane and Fred and Greg Brooker. And, and so that's how I met you guys. And I also want to credit, I want to tell you, Fred, that you are actually the reason why I've been writing now. Wow. And it's because when you had that job on Enterprise, that was the first time I did any screenwriting since I had initially tried to learn how to be a screenwriter the first time Star Trek had an open submissions policy like 91, 92. Yeah. So I was like 16 or 17 years old and all I wanted to do was write Star Trek. I didn't care about writing movies. I just wanted to write Star Trek. I love Star Trek. So I wrote the world's worst Star Trek teleplays. They were all just like fan service and I, I still have them actually. And I recently found my rejection letters from the, from the producers. <laughs> But I actually, and I, and this was before final draft. So I had to format, I custom formatted Microsoft Word to give me the tab stops and the screenplay. I did that, wrote three or four of them, forgot about it. And then 10 years later, when you had the job on Enterprise, 
I was like, oh, maybe I can finally get into pitch. And I don't, and so I had to write a sample and I wrote one and you very graciously uh, read it and actually went over it on the phone with me. Do you remember that? Vaguely. Yeah, I remember you were like, I remember your, the exact words was like, this isn't entirely useless. It was something like that. It was like, <laughs> that's not entirely incompetent. This isn't and, totally terrible. Yeah, this is not totally terrible. And I went and I met you and Andre Bormanis, who I just remember being exhausted on the couch. And we'll, we'll get into Star Trek another time. But that was what like started the bug for me. And that was 20 years ago. That was 2001, 2002. And I was completely green and incompetent. And I've just kept at it. But it was because I knew you and you were, you, you were like, yeah, come on over. Um, and I do, so I do want to say that, like having known you all this time, 25 years, there just, there's some people you just get a vibe from, like, that's a nice guy. Like that guy will help me. Like when I have a problem and it's like, I have a kind of like losery problem. It makes me feel embarrassed. I'm not saying you're like the sucker that we all go to, but it's like Fred <laughs> is a decent human being who will say, it's okay. I'll help you. Here's what to do. This to do. Unless you're really busy. And then it's like, who are you? But most of the time, you're you're <laughs> you're there for us. I re really appreciate that. And here's the thing, guys. I mean, anybody who's watching or listening to this, this is how this is how it's done. I mean, just the fact that you know Charlie's talking about all these friends, and we all you know some of us came from Warren County. Bob Renault and I, and a guy named Ken Lobb. Um, Shane grew up in. Uh, he came from Pittsburgh, but he grew up in Southern California. We all sort of. Uh, it's like on the beach with the, you know, when you're looking for treasure with that, that doohickey, it's like, we all sort of gravitate towards one another. And in the same way that, you know, you were interested in Star Trek, we had all of our sort of nerdy passions and that's what made us friends. And I'll tell you, all of us got more jobs from knowing each other than we ever would have done if we just sort of went in cold. That is absolutely, absolutely true, Fred. I have a, a friend I came out uh, with uh, from the University of Miami. There were a handful of us that wanted to be screenwriters. And he uh, was fortunate enough to get on um, a show in the mid 90s on M NBC. And pretty much for the 20, 30 years after that, so many of his writing opportunities came from that original staff of writers that he was part of because as they basically expanded out and got on other shows and became executive producers and showrunners, they all remembered each other and they all knew each other and hired each other. And that's one of the things that you learn. And, and you know, you, so that's why it's valuable, as you're saying, to uh, try to make as many friends as possible, not be a jerk because you want to generate goodwill. And when people uh, like you, they want to hire you. <laughs> and, and if one of us strikes gold, then the people that we were for, I mean, Joel Silver was the benefactor of almost all of us. I mean, once he, once Shane and, and Joel had, had hooked up, he said, hey, uh, I, you're, are your friends writers too? And he said, yeah, all of them. So, you know, I, I wrote <laughs> movies and TV for Joel. Uh, uh, Bob Renault did. I mean, we all sort of joined the club. I mean, he, he actually kept us all uh, going for quite some time. Shane well, I, is I, a super loyal person. Yeah, incredibly, incredibly nice guy. Uh, but what you're saying, Fred, brings up a, a good sort of like start off question was. Um, Wait, I have, to, I have to interject one thing very oh, quickly, yeah, because it, this is so hard for people to, to figure out, like, like, how do I I don't know these people. I didn't you know, I'm not from 25 years ago. How do I meet them? So if anybody wrote us right now and said, hey, will you read my script? It's like, ugh, you know, maybe, probably not. I don't want to. But I guarantee if anybody right now wrote me and said, hey, your show's kind of cool, but it looks like you only have 92 views. And would you like somebody to help you promote it on social? I go, oh God, please, yes, help me. <laughs> no, really, and, then I, and that's not that hard to just put out some tweets and say, hey, these guys are having a cool show and I'll put it on Instagram. And then do that for a few weeks and say, hey, we read my script. And of course I would, because you're a pal. What, what Lucas just said, that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's, that's good thinking, Lucas. We're all connected. Yeah. Um, anyway so, so take so it away. yeah qu quick first question fred um how many scripts did you have to write before you wrote one that was actually good in your mind three so there was a learning curve of three scripts before you had something you felt was good enough yep. to actually give to people in the industry right when i was at ucla and i i um uh i, I tried to get into the film school and they they wouldn't take me which doesn't really matter because you can't start making films till your junior year anyway. 
So, mm -hmm. but I was not in the film program. So I said, well, you know, I'm just going to do it anyway. So I started uh, writing scripts. The first one was a, um, was a kind of a truckers in space. This was a late seventies, early eighties. So truckers were big, big. I said, I'm going to do a truck, a space truckers movie. Um, this is before there was a movie actually called space truckers. Um, and it, it was terrible. And I threw it in a drawer. Then um, I wrote one, I wrote a um, private eye spoof, um, which uh, was better, but it, it, it was no great shakes. So I put that in the drawer. And then I wrote one just because I'd heard that John Landis had written, uh, I think, American Werewolf in like a couple of days. And I said, all right, this weekend, I'm going to write a whole screenplay from start to finish. And I wrote that one. And that was probably the worst of the bunch. But uh, somehow or other, the fourth script, um, I think I tried harder, uh, I aimed higher. And uh, that one, I, I, I wormed my way into a screenwriting class in the film school at, UCL, at UCLA, even though I wasn't in the program. And um, I turned in the first 30 pages of the script and the, the professor called me to his office and he said, he said, so, you know, I'm looking at your transcripts, I'm looking at all your stuff. Now, you know, you're not in uh, the, the, the film school. I said, yeah, I know. Well, you're technically not allowed to take this class. So I don't know how they got you into it. And I said, oh, but I've read your, your 30 pages and it's kind of expert. So I don't know what to do with you, he said. <laughs> so I said, well, I don't want to get you in trouble. So I'm going to finish my script and thank you very much. And I finished that script. And um, at that point, I was looking for an agent. And there was a young, young agent named David Greenblatt at ICM. Uh, and I can't remember who set me up with him, but I gave him the script on a Friday night. He called me that Sunday the fall, uh, over the weekend. He said, I think this is terrific and I'd like to represent you. And he's my agent and manager to this day. It's amazing. Hmm. Okay, so three scripts. Um, so how long from the writing the first script to actually getting representation, what period of time would you say that was? From the first script to the, for to the fourth one was the one that I signed with an, with a, with an agent. Okay. But I, didn't but I didn't show the other ones really to anybody. So, so in terms of like, from the time you wanted to actually write and get a representative to the time you actually wrote enough scripts to be, be good enough to get a representative, three years, four years, five years? That's, th that's it right there. What you just said is, is it right there. Okay. It, it's wonderful to write 100 pages or 120 or 98 or however long your script is. Mm -hmm. But if, if you don't feel that it measures up, or if you show it to close friends who you're willing to listen to the truth, and not get right. the script. It's great. That's a that's a recipe for disaster. But but you can you can sort of read the tea leaves. At least I could. I was like, this is more sophisticated. This has a shape. There's something here, and mm -hmm. and that's how I look at scripts when I'm when I'm sent to them. As I say, this there's something here. Sometimes it's a home run, right? But uh, not always. And you have to be very uh, self critical. Now, when it comes to original ideas, how do you decide which one is worth, out of all the ones you have, is worth sitting down and spending three or four months to actually write it? It's a great question. I mean, it's very easy to, to start something and get really excited about it and get up ahead of steam and then go, eh, I don't know about this. I mean, I've got more un, you know, started and unfinished scripts than well, probably every writer has that. Sure. Um, I think it's like running a Relay, it's like running a running laps or running a relay race, you know, pick your sports analogy. But mm -hmm. when you're when you're jogging or running, you sort of know if you're gonna get to the end or not, or if you're just gonna, or or if you're tired and you don't want to keep going. And there are times when you just push yourself that, that much further. And um, it, it generally pays off because there's a reason that you stop writing something, and there's a reason that you continue to the end. And usually that's because. You know, your little Jiminy Cricket in, on your shoulders is telling you this this might be worth something. I think a lot of uh, up and coming screenwriters do a lot of reading about various people's uh, process because, yeah. you know, there's no one right way to do it. And everybody kind of develops their own way. I'm sure you write differently than Lucas and Lucas writes differently than me. But like in terms of your actual process of writing, do you, do you outline? Do you do a full treatment? Do you use index cards? At this point, after this many years, is there a certain like muscle memory of this is the way I go about doing it? It's actually evolved. I did find early on that structure is 
you know, William Goldman, my, my hero, my favorite screenwriter, always said screenplays are structure, which means going in blind is probably not a good idea because you it's, it's like taking a road trip. You kind of want to yeah. know where you're going. So mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of at least outlining. I mean, index cards are great because it, it's not that hard to take up an index card and just write a scene idea. Right. You know, Jim falls into the pit. There mm -hmm. you go. And, and that's kind of been my MO since uh, after, after I'd done a few. So, so you use a rough outlines of beats or ideas of scenes yeah. in chronological order that you build over time as opposed to like a James Cameron scriptment or something like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't spend too much time actually rendering until it's time to actually render. But what's interesting, I'm working on something right now. Uh, and um, I got very excited about it. And I hammered out the opening, just wrote it free form. I knew kind of, I know where it's going. I know what the premise of the piece is. I kind of know what the third act is in broad brushstrokes, but I just started writing before I had a, an outline. And then I was sort of piecemeal doing the next scene, scene, scene. And I kind of know where I'm going, but because I don't have my index cards or an outline, I've been, I made very little progress on it for the last like two months. So that's interesting. What, yeah. So what that's telling me is if I had those cards, I'd maybe take a stab at those scenes, but I don't know what the scenes are yet. So I'm a big um, fan of outlining in whatever way you want to do it. It can be index cards. It can be a, a beat outline. It can be a short story. It can be whatever you want, but, but okay. it laid out so you know where you're going. Uh, where, where and when do you write? Do you have like a regular, like I have an office and I work from 10 to two or anything like that? Or is it very loose? No, I never wanted to be a writer. I always want to just be a filmmaker. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm very undisciplined. <laughs> okay. Um, when you do write, how long would you say approximately you write for each day? Handful hours, three, four hours? Uh, yeah. I mean, if I'm in the groove, mm -hmm. I'm in the groove less than I used to be. So those I can do those two or three hours, but those are maybe weeks apart sometimes. Can you confirm that uh, as a, somebody who's made a living as a writer for many years, it's still you've got to will yourself to get to the damn computer and you'll do anything <laughs> before you get One, there? One hundred percent. But the but the good news is if you are compelled and people are, um, that's a good sign. OK. Um, approximately when you are really writing something, how, how long does it take you to finish a, a first draft, provided you're not writing a script in a weekend? Just on average, if you got a writing assignment, how long does it take you to finish a first draft? Two months, it's three funny. months? It, well, it's funny. Uh, Lucas was talking about working on Star Trek. And in, in, in those days, we broke the story as, a, as the writing staff. We all sat in a room, all of us, and we went through and did scene, 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 scene until we had a beat outline, which um, Terry Metalis, who's now running, who's now running uh, Star Trek Picard, he would type that up. And then that, those pages would then go to whoever was assigned that episode. Mm -hmm. and in those days, I would write, a, I'd write an episode of Enterprise in a week because that was what was expected of me. But when you don't have somebody expecting anything of you, uh, in my case, it's deadly because I'll, I'll just take forever. Okay. Um, I'd say, I'd say th three months. If, 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 if you put a gun to my head and said, okay, how long will it take you to write this? I'll say, give me how, how much of what you're, you've, you've done, would you say the last 10 years would be assignment work versus spec work? I've mostly done spec work my entire career. Oh, really? Because yeah. you're famous for doing some big IP assignments. Yeah. Yeah, but... Uh, or you're, well, you're known some, in the industry for that. Well, yeah. Well, something like The Predator was interesting because, you know, it was basically a go movie as soon as we were hired to write it. So that that's a script that probably took three, three-ish months, three or four months, but then was continually, you know, rewritten as we got into production and prepping and all that stuff. So it, 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 I, I don't think there's absolutes, at least I'm not capable of telling you, this is how long it takes. Well, the, the, the Predator is a good um, segue for, um, you know, you've worked a number of times with your friend and, and sometimes partner Shane Black. W mm -hmm. What are the big differences between 
writing something alone versus writing something with a partner? Like what are the, some of the benefits and challenges of writing with somebody else? Well, you don't feel so alone. Writing is a very lonely, as you guys I'm sure, I'm sure can attest, writing is a very lonely uh, endeavor. And it's fun to have somebody just to bounce things off of. Mm -hmm. um, that's one, uh, that's one upside to having a partner. The other upside is that everybody has their strengths and their weaknesses. Mm -hmm. so you let the person with the strengths uh, play to their strengths and uh, you play to your strengths. And then if, ideally, knock wood, you have nothing but strengths. Um, now, I'm, I'm sure people are asking, and this is probably different for every writing team. Are you actually in the same room together writing where there's a you know, computer or laptop and, and you guys are pacing. And is there one person who's sitting there doing most of the typing while you know, you're both talking or in your case, uh, or in this particular writing relationship, how does it really work when you're writing a scene? Shane and I have written one, two, three, four, somewhere between, well, let's say six, because it could be five, could be seven. Right. Could be more, but uh, we literally only once ever sat in a room and wrote a scene together. Once. Mm. And that's the scene in the Monster Squad where the kids are outside the scary mansion and Fat Kid is getting cold feet and saying, let's be Math Squad instead. <laughs> and we wrote that scene together in a room. And that's the only time ever that we did that. Okay, so then what do you, do you break up the scenes? Do you basically yeah. have your, your list of, these are all the scenes, you do these three scenes, I'll do these four scenes. Something then when you like write that. them, yeah. you get together and compile yeah, them? something like that. The Predator was, I, I got first position on that one because I rendered all of the writing sort of first and then Shane came in and rewrote me. Right. So it ends up to be 50-50 in terms of us deciding what the movie's going to be. And, right. Um, but then in terms of the actual uh, screenwriting doing the pages i did the pages first and then he rewrote me there were some instances where he said i'm going to take a shot at this and he would and i'd say go with god uh so what do you do when there's a big creative difference when there is something that like i think this is the right way to go you, you know no well, I, don't, we, I don't agree i don't agree like how does that whole process work how do you decide what actually wins the day in terms of the idea uh, I think we, I think our barometers are fairly similar, which is why we, I think, work well together. But, but mm -hmm. the other thing about working with your friends is that you don't have to stand on ceremony. Like he'll right. come up, he'll come up with something, and I go, "That blows." We're not mm -hmm. gonna, <laughs> yeah, and I'll do something and go, and he'll go, "Really Ew, stinky." So it's we have fun with it. Yeah. And, and sometimes when you're in a partnership, and this this applies to any partnership you have in life, marriage included. When your partner is making a, fa a, 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 a stinky face, that's probably a sign that you're going down a road that they're not comfortable with. And you have to really believe in yourself. And something like The Predator was very much his movie. So I always, uh, throughout that process, would, would uh, uh, let, let him take the day every time. You, do you feel like over time, like I, I feel like this personally, I don't know about other people, but like, Ego was more of an issue when I was a younger person, when I was in my 20s. Now that I'm in my 50s, I don't care. I, I want the best idea. You know, if I'm working with a partner, if I'm talking to other people, I, I want the good idea. I'm less concerned about like, I have to win the creative argument because it's like, I'm not, it's, it's too, I just want to do the best thing. Is well, that I true? Because of your experience, you know, and you've worked with some A-list people, I think at this point, you know that that's, that, that comes from experience. It comes from a sense of, uh, of, of feeling confident in what you're doing. And when you start out, you don't feel confident. So sometimes you fall back on ego and yeah. arguments just to sort of plant your flag. Like, I matter, damn it. But mm -hmm. what you're saying is absolutely right. What you want is the best ideas. And and people can disagree about what the best ideas are. Those are actually sure. the most interesting creative discussions or when you're both passionate and, you're, and you could both be right, that's when you have to really uh, figure out what's the right way to go. But those are fun um, challenges. Once you, have some, once you have some confidence, all of that becomes fun. Did you ever suffer from imposter syndrome? 
Well, I, I don't think I'm all that in a bag of chips anyway. So I, I, I've never not had imposter syndrome. Okay. All right. Because I know that's a very common thing for, you know, people in the business um, to, 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 to deal with. Um, I think it's about knowing <clears throat> when the work you're doing is, first of all, you have masters in, in the movie business. Movies and television are very expensive. So there's no room for, you know, you to be, to, 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 to think that you're the, the, the bee's knees if, if it's not serving the, the bigger picture and the people around you and your collaborators. So um, I think it's really about, again, it's about confidence. You know, I think pretty, I think, I feel pretty strongly that this is going to work. And mm-hmm. if nobody argues with you, then you go for it. But, but ego is tricky because it can, it can screw you. Um, now, going back to, uh, we we're talking about the IP that you've worked on over your career, and you've worked with quite a bit of big IP, uh, Godzilla and Johnny Quest and RoboCop and Star Trek and Predator. Cliffhanger. Now, you know, nowadays, Hollywood is all about the IP, right? Yeah. That's, that's what they want to make movies about. It's harder to get an original uh, set up. Yeah. How do you feel about that personally? And what do you, what do you think are the big differences, um, you know, between... Uh, if there's any, between writing uh, an original project or writing something that's actually based on I- IP? Um, I don't think there's any difference except that established IP has certain pitfalls that an original doesn't because they've established the template for you. Like Lucas right. was talking about writing for Star Trek. There's a, uh, at least at the time that I was doing uh, Enterprise, S- Star Trek had gone through some iterations from the original series to the movies, to Next Gen and Voyager. And, and it, was, it, it, it seemed to me that it was sort of constantly unfolding in slightly different directions. But my experience with Star Trek fans was that they were all very firm about what it is and what it isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the problem with IP is what is it and what isn't it? Um, the Predator is a good example just because it's fresh and it's the last thing that, that, that uh, Shane and I did. We we really felt that the, the idea of the predators as hunters has been played out in three, four movies, five movies. It's like, that's okay. What else do they do? I said to him, I said, if you go to the Ozarks and you find some guy with a, you know, with a Ford station wagon and a bunch of guns, he's hunting. Does he have a wife? Does he have a kids? Is he smart? What does he do for work? What we tried to do early on was to create more information about the predators civilization and their world and why they're here and what were the differences between them and nobody gave a shit about that and I maintain nobody still gives a shit about the new movie prey is just about people being hunted by the predators it's like what else do they do it's like Mr. Magoo, all he ever does is not see things dwell and walk (laughs) in the walls it's like what can't we do more um right so that's the problem with IP is that, is that the, the owners of the IP are very wary of you coloring outside the box because they're afraid that that's going to screw up the fan response to it. Well, oh, okay. So how conscious are you when you and when, when, when you guys get the assignment, we want to do a Predator movie. Yeah. If we don't have anything, you guys come up with something and you're starting from scratch. Right. How conscious are you, if at all, yeah. of what the fan expectations are when you're constructing what you want to do? Do you, is that a consideration where you're just like, sure. or do you just say, I don't care. I don't care. I'm going to do it. Well, sure care. it is. But, but, but in that case, it's a, in, in many cases, it's kind of a given, you know, if you're doing a Star Trek, you know, there's going to be a spaceship and you know, there's going to be a crew and you know, there's going to be a hierarchy and there's a whole bunch of things that are just a given. So with, with, uh, with the predator, we knew kind of that there was going to be hunts and there was going to be night vision and there was going to be uh, violence and there were going to be wisecracks. And then we said to ourselves, well, what could we bring that's kind of interesting and fun? And, and Shane and I are both big fans of, uh, you know, stuff like the Dirty Dozen. Right. So let's, let's do the Dirty Dozen because the original predator wasn't really that. They were, mm. they were all sort of macho guys and they were doing a job but that notion of, of each of them having like a real unique personality and, and, and the, the, the camaraderie and the 
jokes between them and all that stuff. That was something that we brought that we knew was coloring within the lines, but that hadn't ex done been done exactly that way before. So okay. it's, IP is tricky. Um, you've also worked on sequels, uh, writing uh, and directing RoboCop 3 and writing uh, an unproduced sequel to Cliffhanger and, yeah. you know, and, and Predators we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, how, do, how, do you, how do you approach sequels and what do you think, uh, you know, is important to doing it right and what lessons have you learned from, from working on them? Not just IP, but sequels now. Yeah, uh, sort of the same conversation, isn't it? Is it, it the same it, thing? It is, it is but, but I think it's important to me to say that the experience has almost always left a bad taste in my mouth because with an original, yes, the audience, ultimately the audience is the arbiter of whatever you do whatever you make mm -hmm. and if it's your dream and it's completely unique and special and original and they hate it that hurts a lot but it almost hurts worse when you're doing other people's ideas because it's not your fault you don't feel like it's your fault necessarily necessarily mm -hmm. um you know i uh robocop 3 was a was a, was my, my favorite experience making a movie and it was very difficult because people mostly hated it. And nowadays, this is, this is my problem, guys. This is my problem in a nutshell, is I do stuff and nobody cares. And then 20 years later, they think it's great, which is a really heartwarming, but a really bad way to have a career. Because you, right. need, to go, you need to go from the hit to the hit to the hit. And with right. me, it's, I do the bomb everyone hates. And then everybody goes, wait a minute, that was really good. Here's the next bomb. And then 20 years later, they make a documentary about how much people love it. Well, and it's like, guys, I really, really am touched by how much you, you like this movie. Where were you 20 years ago? Where were you 10 years ago? It's really, it's, it's tough. So I this thought, actually, oh, sorry, go ahead. Lucas. I just want to say that I thought <clears throat> for anybody to do a RoboCop sequel, that is one of the hardest things that I think anybody could do, continue the story because it's so built into the first movie that the when he says, what's your name, son, Murphy, that's the end of the story. Absolutely, 100%. But that's why the second movie doesn't work. And that's why I tried to give a heart to the third movie. I mean, the other thing that we're, that, that we're not talking about that we should talk about is, is tone. And when you talk about a sequel or a, or a franchise, part of it is story. What's going to happen with these characters that we love? Or what's going to happen with this premise that we love? The, 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 the really other important question is, what's, going to, what's the journey going to feel like? What's the tone of it? And I think that Verhoeven's RoboCop movie is, is, is uh, I hesitate to say a masterpiece, but for what it is, it's absolutely brilliant. It's very dark. It's very caustic and mordantly funny and a very strange movie. And mm -hmm. here, here's a <clears throat> European making fun of America with, yeah. with you know, a Dutch sensibility. And it's like, boy, does he nail how stupid and fucked up we are. And okay, possibly we try not to swear on the show. How, how screwed up and it's impossible to replicate that. Yeah. And, um, and Kirshner, who's one of the greats. One I know, of the greats, what happened? What happened was you had Frank Miller, who was also, I think, a genius. Um, they were trying to replicate something that's unreplicatable. The first and, movie, it, it not only has all the things you said, it has such humanity to it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, so yeah, IP is very difficult. And you're right, Charles, that now we're in a time when that's kind of the springboard for almost everything. It's yeah. hard to come up with stuff that's original. So, so you're stuck seeing, you know, I mean, how many Marvel characters have their own franchises? How many, <laughs> how many Star Wars are there? It's like, I, I don't need to know where Obi-Wan went to the bathroom before he went to Mos Eisley. I don't care. I've already seen his soul well, story. Yeah, and it always, I, it, it's obvious I, why the <laughs> studios do this because it's the built-in, you know, marketing. But I mean, I mean, I mean here's it the thing. It demystifies it. And but nobody it. ever says, you know what? Let's do something else. <laughs> nobody right, ever says that. Literally, you know, working for Jerry for 30 years and hearing every pitch that's going around Hollywood, you wouldn't believe some of the pitches of some of the quote unquote IP mm -hmm. that we heard over the years. We heard 
a pitch to turn Mad Libs into a movie. I'm sure most of the audience doesn't even remember what Mad Libs is. It was like a paper game where you would have a little story and it would like leave little blanks in the sentences where it would say noun, verb, adjective, and you would have to come up with some sort of silly word that would make the story well, the funny. The only noun you're ever, ever supposed to use is poop. All kids know Yes. That. So uh, we, we heard a pitch for Lionel Trains. That was the whole thing, Lionel Trains. Well, it's a brand, Lionel Trains. Uh, we, we heard one. Um, I won't mention who the filmmaker is, but you know who the filmmaker is. He came in and he pitched a movie based on Peeps, the little Easter candy, the marshmallow bird Peeps, Peeps movie. Um, and it was all I could do, me and my colleague, to kind of stifle, you know, you got to be effing kidding us <laughs> when we're hearing the pitch. And the funny thing is, towards the end of it, even the filmmaker was like, I know, guys, I know. But like, I got the rights of the peeps and I'm like going out there. He he copped to the fact that this is ridiculous, but he's rolling the dice because you just, you never know what might what might work. They made a movie of Battleship. I know one of the executives. He, he was like, yeah, that didn't quite work. But well, remember back in the 80s, they made Clue. And their gimmick was that they actually shot different endings so yeah, that three somebody endings. else, so that it's a who done it. So somebody else done it, depending on which screening you see of the movie. But the truth of the matter is that Clue is just a pastiche of, of uh, you know, what's your name? Old British. Agatha Christie. It's, Agatha it's, Christie. it's murder by Which, where, where you have Ryan Johnson makes yeah. his own Agatha Christie movies right. that are, and, and, and those are terrific movies. And it's like, well, just make it your own. It's like, come on guys. Yeah, I mean, the, the ones that the filmmakers that I'm actually impressed by are, um, you know, Lord and Miller, because mm -hmm. Lord and Miller take these IPs that are like, you got to be effing kidding. And they're yeah. like, yeah, we know, but we're just going to have such a great time with it, whether it's Lego or 21 Jump Street, and it constantly surprises you. I'm dying to know what they did with that solo movie they threw away. <laughs> oh, I would love to see that. Right? Because there's a whole yeah. solo movie. They literally just jumped the whole thing. Like, what was the tone of that movie that Disney's like, no, 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 no. Oh, that's we'll never know. Say. Yeah. I would love to know. Yeah, yeah, along with that, the David that movie, I, That's an, in, an interesting thing to me. It's like, you've got billions of dollars riding on this. And everybody agrees, oh, let's recast Harrison Ford. I mean, this poor kid they hired to, to play, we all know what young Harrison Ford is like. We love him. Yeah. So it's not like you're recasting Bill Shatner with a, with Chris Pine, where it's like, okay, you know, it's not like... It's not Bill Shatner. It's not the same actor thing. playing the same part. Yeah, but you can't have that with, when we remember, I think Harrison Ford is a movie star, Bill Shatner is a TV star. I think there's a difference. I think it was a thankless uh, thing to try and have some other guy try to play young Harrison Ford when we all know he's too short, the voice is wrong. And Every and it makes the character wrong, and I just think it was. Uh, and I think they admitted as much. They were like, "Oops, they well, you remember, we're you remember, not doing that anymore." You remember for five minutes at the end of the Indiana Jones movie that uh, Shia LaBeouf was in, where yeah. there was yeah. even a thought in anybody's yeah. mind, "We're going to pass the torch," and audiences are going to want to see Shia LaBeouf as Indiana. Yeah, it just I don't. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in those meetings, or the, you know what? Maybe the audience will want it. No, no, these are, it's Harrison Ford and we're not going to remake that. But but everything is a remake and people want IP and your own film, The Monster Squad, right? Was an example of this. I know that there was a period uh, where Platinum Dunes, my friend uh, Andrew Form was one of the guys working with Michael Bay that there was a brief period of time when they were talking about remaking The Monster Squad as a title, right? But here's the here's the irony. Here's here I, I'd like to like to make my mission statement here because we're talking a lot about IP, and yeah. I think we're doing that because we're surrounded by it and it's our daily bread and butter. You could have a conversation with a screenwriter and never talk about it once. You could talk to David Mamet or or Stephen Zalian or something, and they'll never talk about any of the things we're talking about because we are confronted with it more now than ever. What was interesting to me and ironic is that I loved the Universal Monster movies when I was a little kid. And I loved all of the black and white comedians, the Marx Brothers, Abbott and Costello, Laurel and Hardy. And I loved the Little Rascals. And so that was my pitch. 
his plan was, I want to do the Little Rascals meet the Universal Monsters. We finished the script. We took it to Universal because I wanted to use the little black and white plane at the beginning and say it's a Universal picture. And I wanted to use the Jack Pierce makeups from the for those films. Universal had no interest in this property whatsoever because they said that just doesn't, that IP doesn't mean anything to us. We're happy to put Frankenstein on a, on a mug at the studio tour, but there's no movies to be made for these monsters. The last time I was at Universal, I saw a building and a whole parking lot with dark universe logo everywhere. They're killing themselves to do what they didn't wanna do with us in 1987. And it drives me nuts, but it does, but there is a lesson. If, you, if, if there's something you love that's IP that nobody knows about, jump on it. If it's IP everybody knows about, you're dead. Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very wise comment. I, I've, never, um, I've, I've never had the experience of trying to write anything from IP. I mean, I'm no, I don't have access to that, those kinds of auspices, but I just always figure, let me write things that are, that are two things, that they're cost conscious and they're castable. And they're commercial. That's you know, write, a, write a cheap par movie with a cool concept. Charlie read the one I did. Um, yeah. And I made a, I made a, I made my own IP. I made a sci-fi short, and now it's got a couple <clears throat> million views online. But that's still, I can't get people to, to pay attention because I have like it's, it's too cheap, and it's, and yet it's too expensive because the live action is, is I could shoot that for a few hundred grand for, in two and a half weeks but then I need to spend a million and a half on the visual effects. Or people say, well, what, what would the visual effects cost? And I always say, look, do you want it to look like an episode of The Expanse or do you want it to look like a Star Wars movie and one costs a million and the other costs 8 million? It's up to you. Yeah, um, yeah I was just gonna say that, uh, you know, or, or Far Out Space Nuts, probably nobody knows that reference. Didn't you, when you were making uh, Monster Squad, you, you had to fight for the title, right? Because there was like a, wasn't there a- Oh uh, yeah, but it, it, it was small potatoes. That wasn't the problem. Okay, because I know on Ghostbusters, they had to fight with Filmation to get the name Ghostbusters yeah. because up until the time they were releasing it, it was like, is it going to be Ghostbreakers or Ghostbusters? Yeah. Oh, I remember no, that. Yeah, there was two cartoons. Yeah. But the reason yeah. there was that it was a giant, big budget, $30 million Columbia picture with Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray with, from my right. Whereas right. we were just a couple of punk kids and nobody gave a shit. Uh, now right. and, and and the film that went the uh, monster squad the film we're talking about rob cohen had a hand in it and people might know that rob cohen was the director who kicked off <laughs> one of the biggest franchises in the world right now the fast and the furious franchise started with rob cohen directing the first movie um so that he was part of you know your, the, your film uh he was, the peter hyams. He, was he was he was the savior P peter hyams rob cohen keith barish those three guys made that movie happen yeah, I, re I remember, I think it was in 1986, I came out on a field trip with one of my professors who, again, just the luck of the draw, was the producer of Westworld and Capricorn One, Paul Lazarus. He was one of my college mm -hmm. professors. And yeah. it was like, again, how, how weird and fortuitous is it that the producer of two of my favorite movies is one of my college professors? <laughs> so he brought us out on a field trip in uh, 86, I guess. And it was, it was when... You guys must have been shooting Monster Squad, and Peter Hyams, who directed Capricorn One, is one of his friends. So we met with Peter Hyams at the time, and um, uh, he's doing the Presidio, uh, which nobody remembers, but it's a thriller from that period. Yeah, I and remember it's I, Bruce Broughton, right? Uh, yeah. It was. Hey, composer, we know the composer. Peter Peter has me to thank for Bruce Broughton because he was my choice on Monster Squad. Um, <laughs> and and I remember because. Peter, I remember reading, Peter was one of the producers on Monster Squad. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I understand you're working on a movie called Monster Squad. <laughs> and his face just changed. Like, like there was something about like just the, the, the at the time working on it. And it was just like, I was like, what, is, what does that mean? Like, what is, I really want to see that movie. What are, you, what are you talking about? But it was like, whatever, whatever you guys were going through at the time, he was like, he, he wore it on his sleeve. And he was kind of, um, I would say out of the people that we met at the time was, kind of hard-edged like a hard-edged guy very no bullshit out oh, whoops bull poop yeah i gotta um, say it's because i've got eight-year-old twin yeah. girls and i want to be able to edit this and not worry if they're going to walk in and hear anything. that's it. Um, 
uh, but uh, as we as we were saying, the, 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 yeah, IP. So there's the big there's the big things that everybody is like trying to turn into movies, originals which are harder to get off the ground. Then there's the third category, which is the public domain IP. Frankenstein, Dracula, all those characters are in the public domain. So are Bible characters. So are Shakespeare plays. So is, are the Greek myths and the Roman myths. So it's so from, from the from the, from the, the monkeys that, that the copyright's up on. Yeah. Yeah. So. So that's, I was going to say, the, the third option, if you're a young screenwriter and you're just like, well, I, you know, I can't write Star Wars, or I can't write, you know, any of these things I want to write, Marvel movies, but you can go write Santa Claus versus Dracula if you want to write that, and at least they're characters people have heard of, and, and one of the things that I wrote and I set up uh, was, was IP, it was, it was, the, I wrote, uh, I was at Disneyland with my kids, and there was a balloon that had the three princesses, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, and Snow White. And it was at the time, the summer, that uh, McGee's movie, Charlie's Angels, came out. So my brain fused, for whatever reason, those two things. And I'm like, Charlie's Angels with the fairy tale princesses. When does it come and, out? Uh, I wish. <laughs> so it came close. It was one of those things where it, it, I, we wrote, I wrote the screenplay and it was like, okay, their husbands get kidnapped. They all got married happily ever after. Their husbands get kidnapped fighting a, an evil sorceress, and the three princesses have to get out it's of the surgery. castle and go into the woods to find it's their husbands. The searchers right? with the three princesses, and it was a comedy, action comedy, and that was the premise. So I was at the time I was going out and pitching it. I, I you know, I, I pitched it at Sony. I, I got close a number of times, and I didn't sell it as a pitch. And, uh, and then I read in the trades an identical idea of those three princesses, action comedy just sold i'm like ah uh, somebody else beat me to the punch whatever and then a couple of years went by and as we all do huh it never got made so maybe i'll write it anyway i don't know maybe i, may, I, I still think it's a fun idea and i wrote it and uh i remember i wrote it i wrote it with a writing partner and um their agent said can't do anything with us disney owns the princesses shrek you know has the princesses in the new movie you throw it away and start something else i'm like we just spent six months right no 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 no. and i contacted a friend who was a manager i'm like do me a favor and read this and he read it and he's like ah oh, this is kind of fun let me let me see what i can do with it two weeks later he sold it to mgm for like a big chunk of change we uh got a director we got really close and then MGM uh, went through all their bankruptcy problems, essentially. Right. And this was a victim of the bankruptcy problems. But the, the point of that whole story is that was finding public domain IP uh, that you could use as a way to go, okay, it's an original, but it's characters you've heard of before, but remixed in a new configuration. And Hollywood frequently does that. That's why there's been 100 Robin Hood movies and things like that. Um, so that's another, you know, well, you can you can go to if you're a, a young aspiring screenwriter look what's in the public domain come up with an original version of you know frankenstein or santa claus or, or these things because they're evergreens and they always they always sell somebody's always doing some version of those i want to ask fred and forgive my ignorance but would you revisit the monster monster squad would you do a, a sequel or a reboot or a uh it, as as it happens we uh we have a lawyer that we that is uh going through the machinations now because the copyright is up so hopefully if all goes well we will actually um control the copyright in the sense that if anybody else wanted to do it they'd have to come through us first we've had one preliminary conversation about it um but I really, I really want to emphasize this because we're talking a lot about, you know, encouraging presumably people who are watching, listening, or, or writers, or, or want, want aspiring to writers, yeah, aspiring writers, and just from my two cents, if you're willing to hear my two cents, yes, you can find uh, intellectual property that hasn't been exploited and put your own spin on it. But I'm watching, but largely because of the pandemic, you know, the theatrical experience now is, it's great when you can do it, but people are doing it less. The floodgates have opened in streaming. I think maybe probably the best work that's being done is on television now. And my advice would be to just forget about IP and come up with something that's really meaningful, that excites you, that you think is cool. Which is not to say that it's not genre. I'm a, you know, I'm a genre guy. I always have been. I probably always will be. But to come up with some sort of 
cobble together a Frankenstein monster of all your favorite stuff, but, but you know, brand it with yourself and don't try to follow in the footsteps of all these other stuff because everybody's already doing that. Mm -hmm. what's, what's special about you and what can you do that's unique and completely different from what everybody else is doing? And I think that that actually stands you in better stead than trying to do something that's too much like what somebody else is doing. So that's my only problem right now with Monster Squad is Stranger Things has killed us. It's like, no, it's the same, it's the same thing. It's the mm -hmm. same thing. I could catch. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I don't think, I don't know. I mean, I, I trust what you're saying, but I would think that uh, somebody, somebody would be interested just because this, oh, is, uh, it, this is the I real thing. thing. It's, it's not about whether we can get somebody interested in, in, in resurrecting the Monster Squad. Mm -hmm. It's, are we interested in resurrecting the Monster Squad? And right. if we aren't, who could do it that would make it worth doing and not just to cash it? Well, isn't, I mean, I don't, we'll just delete this if you don't want me to say this out loud, but isn't, wouldn't the interesting thing to be to be set it now and have it be the, the, the children of the characters and how That's their childhood that, is different that, from- that is, that is the closest to an idea that we have right now. Yeah. The, the, the it part two of the Monster Squad. Again, yeah. Charles is exactly right. It's it part two. Yeah. So we I mean, what, 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 which, which by the way, is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just we like that's what we compare it to. We need to wait a couple of years until yeah. Stranger Things and the It movies are in our rear view mirror several right. miles back because, and this is just me and maybe I'm wrong. I just don't believe in, in striking while the iron is hot if you don't know if the iron is hot. Right, that makes sense. Um, how do you feel about you know writing for TV compared to movies? When you were writing on television shows and there were writers' rooms, and did you like that you know uh, dynamic of being in a room and everybody breaking the story and you've got the map? Go out and spend a week writing this now. I mean, um, no, I didn't like that. But what's interesting is I recently did um, a pilot for a company that will remain nameless. And it, it's an IP that you would know that's very famous that shall remain nameless. Mm -hmm. And I had a script, uh, uh, Shane and I worked on this together, um, but he very kindly at one point said, you know what, I think you have, I think you have a North Star that I don't have, so, so go man, go. So both of our names are on it, but he really let me have my way with it. And we had a final script or a finished complete script and our producer very kindly put together a dinner and we got a bunch of great writers, including some heroes of mine. And we just went through the script and said, what's, you know, what can we fix? What's, what, what does it need? What's working? What's not working? And it became so much better from that experience. So I'm a big fan of the writer's room if it's the right writer's room. Um, it's uh, that's 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 an interesting observation because it, uh, working on Bruckheimer films, we did the same thing. There would be times when we would have a round table. Yeah, you know, we we've had a rough cut of the movie, mm -hmm. uh, and then we would put together a round table for it. Uh, for example, we did a movie called G Force, which is Mission Impossible with guinea pigs. Right. And so we we had a rough cut. This was during the writer strike at the time that they were shooting the movie. So it was kind of a very um, mixed bag in in terms of his original uh, edit. And so they put together this, this interesting writer's room and it was like Simpsons writers, really, really funny writers. And I, I'd never really been in a writer's room, but this kind of replicated the experience. And what I found funny about it was, God, they came up with some of the funniest stuff ever, but because it's sort of like a free form free for all, it was like, they're pitching a version of the movie we can never make because it's sort of no holds barred. They're pitching like dirty jokes right. and they're hilarious but we can't make an R-rated G-Force, but like, oh, it's too bad. And it's like, it made me think like, if somebody was smart enough to do that, oh, this movie would be huge. And years oh, later- Sausage Party. Right? Yeah, years later they did Sausage Party. Yeah. But at the time I was I was going like, it's too bad somebody doesn't do a talking animal movie like called The Zoo that's like Animal House, but it's hard R and that's what it is. And, um, and yeah, they came up with great jokes. We did use, you know, some of the jokes. Same thing with one of the bad boys movies. They did a round table and, you know, a lot of big young comedy writers came in, pitched a lot of great ideas and thematic ideas. And that's why, you know, the third movie, I think, surprised a lot of people, the bad boys movie, because yeah. it, it was like, you know, you had it, fresh it, blood. I mean, it'd been a long time since. You'd been yeah. Yeah. 
but but so I agree with you there on the on the writers room. If if you're using it right, could be a great hive mind experience that dramatically increases uh, a well, piece of material. Yeah, we don't want to put Fred on the spot, but I, I I will tell our audience that when you were on Enterprise, it was a new show, and this is well known. It was just a very high stress environment, and the showrunner was trying to figure out how to make it his own show. And it was, I know you didn't have a good time, but other people have said the same thing. That's fair to say, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, what is, uh, if you don't mind asking, you don't have to answer this, but what, were there greater writing gigs that you went up for, open writing assignments that you really wanted, that you came close but didn't, didn't get, but like the, the one that kind of got away, something that you just, God, I wish I would have gotten that gig. Anything like that over the years? Not really? No. no. Okay, that's good. Um, what do you think is the best script you've written of your own scripts? You know, yeah. you've written, I'm sure dozens, but is there like one that's like, that is my Chinatown or that is like out of all of them. And it could be an unproduced one, but you know, something that you just, I'm really proud of this piece. Your own I personal favorite. I wish I had a great answer for that, but I really don't. Like I said, I mean, I always just, I always wanted to be a director. You know, Spielberg was, Mr. Spielberg is looking over my shoulder now. Um, he signed that photo for me in 1978. So mm. I was very, I mean, Jaws kind of rocked my world. So I've always wanted to be a director and, and writing was the way in. Right. So, so I don't particularly have any ego as a writer. I mean, I have my good days, I have my bad days. I think everything I've done has something good in it and something stinky in it. Mm. Um, I'm, not, I'm not precious about it. So well, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Did, was there more? No, I want to ask. Um, you mentioned that most of the things you've been you've done are, are specs, and without asking you to tell us what they are, are there? I assume are most of them genre, or all of them genre? Yeah. And much. is there? Do you find that there's? Um, are are most of them like all audiences, or are there grown up ones, R rated ones, or do definitely? I've there? definitely run the gamut. I've definitely yeah. run the gamut. And is there like a? Do you find yourself? Because I know this happens to me, writing the same themes over and over, the same archetypes over and over. Are there things that you that you obsess upon that are just sort of who you are as a person that you find yourself keep going back to? It's a really interesting question. I hadn't thought about that. Um, I've done a couple of unmade pieces um, uh, intended to be independent films, but uh, that sort of tread in the um, in the vigilante world because I look around and I see a lot of stuff that, that ticks me off. And I think that there's something to be said for, and this happened in the seventies and, and the sixties and seventies where, you know, you had Billy Jack and you had, you had these characters who just, you know, would brook no quarter and they were, you know, they're mad. Taxi at, driver, right? Taxi driver. Well, there's, Taxi driver. Do you guys know the death wish story where Winter, I think it was Michael Winter pitched Bronson on doing death wish. And, and Bronson said, I'd like to do that. He goes, oh, make the movie? He goes, no, kill muggers. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, there's something, I think, cathartic about that, uh, about that. And, you know, Taxi Driver, I think, is as good as it gets. Um, and uh, so, so I have been, I've dabbled in that, but I haven't thought about it. I didn't go, you know what, I'm doing this because I'm angry at society and I want to kill muggers. Was your dad a cop? My dad was not. My dad was an artist. Oh, hmm. I think it's just about trying to create through your work, through your creative work, an equilibrium. Trying to create a world that makes sense, because the world that we actually live in, I don't think, makes a lick of sense. Do you, when you do pursue the vigilante themes, do you yeah. find that um, the vigilante is the good guy and he gets away with it, or is it often about? Like that was bad, and he's going to end up punished for his. Uh, uh, Michael Mann is is a, I'm a huge fan of Michael Mann's work. A Thief is one of my favorite movies of all time. And if you ask me, you know, is is the character that 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 James Gunn plays in that movie is he a good guy or a bad guy? Well, he's a thief for a living. He kills people in the movie, but all he wants is to have a wife and a kid and a family and be happy. And I find that very moving. And, and so that's kind of where I'm coming from is, is I'm, I'm reacting to the world that we're, that we live in and saying, you know, how can we create a normalcy? And sometimes 
you know, you're so frustrated that you kind of wish you could take matters into your own hands to make things happen. Is that a um, feeling you remember from when you were a kid? No, I think, no, no, I was a very happy kid. I think it's just, it's, you know, there's the ideas that we have that are personal that we put into movies. And then there's the ideas that are, are stirring in us now, you know, like particularly the last, the, the last couple of years and the last week. I mean, geez, I we're, we're living, we're living in, you know, what's the Chinese proverb? Maybe lucky enough to live in interesting times. But boy. Yeah. I, I Why? Think, what happened? Uh, I think th I think these I don't think think they are interesting times. I think they're sad and dangerous and maddening times, and that's great fuel for creativity. I think. Sure. If you, if you look at all media, painting. Well, look at look all, at the seventies, right? All those yeah, movies and, that we he, grew up loving, Paralyzed yeah. View and Three Days the Condor, all the President's Men, and yeah. they all came out of the same period of like alienation, loss of uh, belief in our institutions. Absolutely. The, the, the center but will this, not hold. That's Vietnam. really not what I think of as a Fred Decker movie like well you're not known for a parallax view type well, well but you wrote Ricochet right I mean that was kind oh, of okay a I forgot version it. of uh that kind of story yeah you know? sure. so true. um is there what's the most heartbreaking story of like a script or a project that you wrote or were set to direct that got really close but then fell apart is there one boy I wish you'd ask before we started because I'd, I'd go through my uh mental rolodex <laughs> um it's okay it's okay we can yeah you know, I, I actually actually have the answer okay i have the answer it would take me probably seven to ten minutes to find it but in the room that i'm in right now is my contract with taft bearish productions to direct the johnny quest movie i was going to say johnny quest right the deal, okay. the, the deal was closed and it, and had monster squad come out and done gangbusters right and made that movie in about 1990 and you could so that's it. your moby dick that's the great white whale yep all right yep okay no that's a great that's a actually a great answer um you were talking about how you want really wanted to be a director and writing was a vehicle to that yeah you like directing better than writing that's like saying do you like eating or or going to the doctor Cre creatively how about what's more creatively fulfilling out of the two uh out of the two activities do you he prefer just said directing but you, you prefer directing creatively well, where did you um where did you learn how to direct did you go to film school for that um i went to the film school of the Raffel, the, the Raffel theater and the new art and uh you name it so what was the first thing you directed night of the creeps night of the creeps yeah and who taught you was it just total make it up Yep. That's awesome. Yep. And that's one of the reasons that I think Peter was frustrated on Monster Squad was that I was doing it my way, which I had sort of made up. And he, in the first couple of days of that movie, he was uh, uh, really, it was very difficult because I wasn't doing it the way it's done. And so what Peter, was your way? What was your way? And what you weren't doing well, master I mean, shots? Or? I mean, if you look at, uh, if you look at, movies from the 30s and 40s. The grammar had been established. And the way that the studio system worked was you shoot a master shot and then you shoot coverage. So you've got a wide shot of the whole scene and you play it all the way through and everybody knows what they're doing. Then you go in tighter, you can do two shots, you can, do, you can pan people in, you can do all that stuff, but it's all very regimented and then do your close-ups. And I didn't do that. If you look at my Night of the Creeps, you'll see a lot of stuff that's like, what, 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 that's, you can't do that, but it kind of works. Um, and Peter basically taught me studio, 1940 studio film directing 101. So if you look at Monster Squad, there's a lot of stuff that, and it's beautifully lit. Bradford May did a great job, but there's scenes that are just very stagey and like proscenium and there is your master shot. And I think it works for that movie because it's kind of um, in the mold of classic old classic universal monster movies of the 40s but uh there's times where it to me feels like it was made in the 40s even though it's in color mm. and um is that from peter yeah yeah and um you know and i did what you just told me reminds me of having read the making of the empire strikes back book they had that problem between george lucas and kirshner kirshner was doing all these very these sort of interlocking masters 
Mm -hmm. And it was driving George crazy because he couldn't, he was locked, it would lock him into an edit. Yeah. And, and it was taking a lot of time too. Yeah. And so George would go over there and say, no, shoot a master and shoot the coverage so that he could tinker with it. And Kirshner was doing these very like artfully sculpted, just yeah. maybe a two shot. I mean, I mean, it was all, it was sort of sh shooting the camera, you know, shooting yeah. the editing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is well, funny. Because... I, now I, I've shot um, in my day, I've directed one 15 minute short. So I'm, of course I'm an expert and the highlight which the is highlight. very well made, if I may. Thank you. The highlight of it was me saying, Dan, when he says that line, can you zoom in? And Dan, the DP, saying, we don't have a zoom lens. So <laughs> I said, can you walk closer? So that's basically where I was at as a director. And um, it was funny. I, I was mostly concerned with performance. And we had a very, I mean, it was inside that set, it was pretty much... Um, the DP and I, we made a shot list together. And then when we actually did it, we threw out the shot list and you know, we would just do a master and they wanted me to block shoot. I was like, Jesus Christ, are you kidding me? It's like, cause they didn't realize I was actually gonna direct the actors and there's just too much performance to, lo to learn. So you just gotta go scene by scene yeah. because the actors, I, I met them that morning. I mean, it was, it, there was a lot of rush stuff. Let, let, let me ask both of you, because you're both directors and, you, you know. Uh, but I'm, not ta I'm not done very, talking about how great I am. Spoiler, spoiler alert for, for Lucas's film. Um, <clears throat> it's a, it, you know, meeting the actors the first day, the whole film is about what, do either of these people know what's actually happening? <laughs> that, so that's really. Yeah, no, it, it worked for what we were doing. And they, I that's really it. tricky though. It was pretty scary, but it was because it's a long story. I don't want to go into it. What was your question, Charles? Uh, well, the question was just uh, what, what, what Lucas was talking about. You were saying that you actually had specific directions to them in terms of what you wanted them to give for performance. I've, I've always heard, and maybe it's a wives' tale, that you're not supposed to do that as a director. You're not supposed to, you know, give them the way to emote, read the line or emote no, the line. No, you don't line get a read. line reading too specific about what it is you want them to do, but maybe that's not the case. If you're dealing with kids, you give them line reads. You do? Yeah. Okay. Oh my but God. Never, I never say, an adult. Wait, okay. I have to say, I had a 10 year old kid who, who didn't even have any lines and he was a great kid and the dad was super nice. And I was like, I didn't even know how to talk to this kid to tell him to run up a hill differently. I mean, I don't, I don't know how you directed five kids in, or more than that in a whole feature. That's insane. Good for I, you. Think, I think it's because I'm, you know, this is going to sound like a horrible cliche and everyone's going to vomit, but I, I'm, I'm a big kid. I mean, I, I, I just projected my, myself onto them. And, and sometimes I would actually do faces, little um, Ashley Bank, who now is a mother of two. But when we were making the movie, she was, you know, six years old. And I just, it was a tight shot on her and I'd be right next to the lens and I'd just, I'd make faces and she'd copy my faces and that's in the movie. So with kids, it's different. With old, with adults, there is a certain respect you have to give them for their process. But a good actor just wants to please you. Okay. And, and whatever it takes to do that, as long as they trust you. If they don't trust you, then you're going to have some problems. But if they trust you, you can give them line readings. You can put a hat on them. You can do whatever you want, and they'll go for it because they know that you're uh, on their side. The stuff you, that I... The stuff oh, that I did that I remember working is at one point I told <clears> the actor, like, you know, you're, you hear it and you're like a dog that hear, heard something, you know, like, and he's like, okay, gotcha. I mean, that's the kind of thing that, something that's playable, that's, that yeah, is. that's what directing is. It's yeah. as if. Yeah. Do this as if such and such. Do this, do this as if you guys are in a bad marriage and this mm -hmm. is a fight. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're not fighter pilots. We're, we're a married couple fight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, anyway. Sp speaking of kids, you, Fred, you have a son. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sure this is of interest. Uh, has he seen your films? He has. Uh, is, do you find it interesting to sort of see what your son thinks of uh, your work uh, compared to the kind of movies that he watches? Well, and, he's... you know. Yeah, he's, he's very supportive. Um, he's uh, 17, going on 18. He's a filmmaker himself. He's oh, tremendous. that's awesome. He's in the other room, so he's probably hearing me talk about him now. He's tremendously talented. And oh, he's, actually, he's actually turning me on now to filmmakers that uh, I was not aware of, that he's <laughs> a big fan of. And his taste is very um, sophisticated. Really? That's, so, that's yeah, really he and cool. I went to the New Beverly and saw Monster Squad a couple months ago. 
and it was a hoot. And I really was was heartened because it's it's very funny. And I, I, I'm not saying that out of ego. I'm saying that out of uh, a tribute to Shane Black. I mean, just yeah. funny lines, and the kids did them right, and it, and it's just it's funny. It's a funny movie. Do you, do you have any the... interest in in directing television? Uh, absolutely. Have you tried? I mean, it's a bad time to be a, a middle aged white. No. <laughs> no, I mean we've talked about that. It's a, it yeah, is an, if. if you know, Shane and I did a did a, a pilot for uh, Amazon called Edge. It was a western, and had that been picked up, I'm sure I would have directed several of them. So I think I, I don't know that I would be good as a gun for hire director, but in terms of if I were to create a series or be involved in creating a series, I, I think I definitely would be. Uh, Why wouldn't you be a good gun for hire? I think because I'm spoiled now, having written most of this, written everything that I directed and, and been mostly a writer, it's like it's harder for me to get into the mindset of the showrunner. It, uh, it's easier if I am the showrunner. Um, I, I'm, I'd never say never. It depends on the, it depends on the thing. I mean, I've been watching, again, Stranger Things 4. I'm in the middle of it now. And it's like, boy, I'd like to do one. They're stealing my shots. I can do my I can do them myself. Are you, or in terms of uh, moving forward at this point in your career, are you equally driven by new uh, original feature film projects or new TV projects? Or are you going, well, there's more opportunities in streaming because there's 900 shows and there's like all these different platforms. So do you think more in terms of I want to launch a TV show rather than an original film? No, I'm, I'm, my heart has always been in the feature format. There's something I think that's very satisfying about the movie starts and it takes you on a journey and then it ends and then you're done. I think that's, that's my, my go-to uh, mode. How, how do you feel about these tectonic shifts that are, as we speak, going on 500 people being let go from Netflix and major, you know, readjustments at Disney and Warner Brothers and David Vesla and, and, and just streaming and, you know, COVID and its effect on the movie. It's a big subject, obviously, but I'm just kind of curious if you have any spitballs of what, what, what to expect over the next five years in terms of entertainment. I wish I knew. I mean, it's kind of like a, a, a Me too. it's like a tsunami just hit us and you're going, you know, yep. where are you going to buy the a new chair? Because the tsunami just destroyed your chair. I, I got to clean up a little bit first and figure it out. Yeah. yeah. I, need dry, I need to dry off and then we'll figure it out. The specs that you've written recently, are, do you write them with the intention to direct? Yes. Um, do you have right now, is there a dream project, either something you've you know, written or want to write or a property you'd like to adapt or remake is uh, that, you're, that you're, you're still hope to tackle? Uh, you don't have to share the specifics of it, but I mean, like something you've long harbored that you would love to do, not Johnny Quest, but something else that, you know. Well, that's, I mean, that to me is the holy grail. Uh, um, yeah, I have a lot of scripts, but, you know, you go through a, a birthing process, you know, you guys know what it's like, you finish a script, and then the further away you get from it, the further you are from, it's like Christmas, you know, you have Christmas, and then January, February, now it's March, it's hard to get back into the Christmas spirit. In yeah. March. So that's kind of how it is with these scripts. It's like, I love it, and I'm in it. Um, the thing that I'm doing now is um, is I'm having tremendous fun. I need to outline it. Kids, kids at home, outline your script. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of making it up as I go, but once it's done, I would love to make it. If I fail to do that, then it's gonna sit on the shelf and I'll probably start something new, so. Do you, um, I don't wanna be nosy about what you're trying to do, but do you, do you, no, yes, do, you, you do. do you, do you, no, look, I'm, no, I seriously, I mean, we know this, we're kidding around, but like we all love Fred and, and um, I'd love to see a movie by you again. Do you find that you write something and you give it to your people and they send it to town and around town and it's like, well, he hasn't directed a movie in such X number of years and it's too expensive and we, or I mean, what happens is it, do people just pass or? Just call your friend Ryan Gosling and tell him to attach himself and your Bob's your uncle. No. Do you know who's a big fan of the Monster Squad? Ryan Gosling. That's right. Um, yeah. Actually, there is a script that's on, that's, uh, it's funny you should say this, that this very week is, uh, is going out uh, to some select producers that I'm attached to direct that I did not write, that somebody else wrote. Mm. Um, so I'll know the answer to your question in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't want to, <laughs> I want to know as much as I can about what you're doing without 
you know, being nosy or being a jerk on a YouTube channel. I mean, <laughs> but it's hard. We all know this is hard. Like Shane is, how famous is Shane? And he goes years between movies because people don't get what he wants to do. I remember, I remember when they wrote The Nice Guys the first time and everybody passed. Everyone was like, what is this crap? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's true. It doesn't matter who you are, honestly, whether you could be Jerry Bruckheimer, you could be Shane, you could be Brad Pitt, you could be anybody. And that doesn't mean you're going to wave a magic wand and get your projects to magically coalesce because yeah. there are so many different elements that have to work. You know, that's why so many projects fall apart at the last second. And, and, and it's Absolutely. heartbreaking when that happens. So, um, but sort of. I mean, if Brad Pitt said, here is my $5 million dream project and it's, you know, about watching paint dry, but I'll star in it. I mean, I imagine he gets the money. I, you know, I mean, maybe I, 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 sometimes if like he'll do that, but then he'll do another movie and that's a lost leader and they know, but you're going to star in the, you know, I am legend, but you know, so we'll waste $5 million in your passion project. In the old days, they might do some version of that, but I don't know the way that these, you know, corporations and these streaming services have now aligned themselves. It's, probably harder to do that kind of stuff uh, than it used to be. Um, well, there's that whole international world. And you told me about your buddy who was doing those Bruce Willis movies. There are actors who have value and these people put together these deals based on the value of the talent and the movies incidental. Well, that's how he used to get the movies made. He would yeah. go to Kevin Costner. He would go to Sylvester Stallone. He would go to John Travolta and say, what's your passion project? Well, my passion project is Battlefield Earth. Battlefield Stop. Earth. <laughs> and that's how Battlefield Earth gets made or, you know, that's so, yeah. Th but, but again, even that business model was 10, 15 years ago. It's lo a little harder these days to do those kind of movies. It's still done, but it's not done as much. Although looking at Nick Cage's oeuvre for the past couple of years, the, you know, 29 movies he seems to do every single year. Never I guess saw. that's how those movies get made, right? Because he's doing a lot of movies. Um. Fred, just uh, as we wrap up, I, I, again, these are aspiring screenwriters. Most of them will probably watch our show, except for our friends and family. <laughs> um, just general practical advice in 2022 for aspiring newcomers who are interested in writing, just, you know, uh, stuff you've learned over the years, uh, just plain spoken advice, any little tidbits that you think people could benefit from? outline is a good one i mean that's very important i think yeah um, i think my i think the thing that just springs to mind right off the bat is i would encourage anyone who wants to be a writer and this is going to go against the conventional wisdom that we've talked about a lot in this is like what's the flavor of the week what's the franchise that hasn't been exploited what's the ip but write something that nobody but you would write Okay, so that would be uh, Diablo Code. Are you writing Juno? Exactly right. right. Exactly that would be right. uh, Michael Arndt writing Little Miss Sunshine. Exactly right. That's what I do. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I was going to say, uh, yeah, yeah, I haven't read I it. I haven't yet. done, I haven't had any success. But interestingly, <laughs> interestingly, both of those movies are family comedies. Yes, they are. Which means they're cheap and castable. Low budget, oddball family comedies, indie sensibility that wound up just catapulting both of those screenwriters from right, nowhere. Do, a vi do the vigilante yeah. family. And, and don't, well, you know, it's, it's <laughs> dark, man. It's dark. But, 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 but to that, to speak to that, the fact that, that my vigilante thing was really, really dark is don't be afraid to just jump off a cliff. Because yeah. that's, that's, as artists, I know it's pretentious to call us as artists, but that's what we are. And that's what art is, is jumping off a cliff. If you play it safe, if you, oh, I don't know about the, oh, I don't want to offend anybody. Well then, okay, then have fun. Go, go not offend somebody and make movies for Lifetime or Hallmark. Yeah, and I, I don't know if Lucas has one of these, but there, I have a, a jump off a cliff idea and I'm wrestling right now with like, you know, do I want to spend four, months of my life working on that idea that I just sort of inherently know is going to be polarizing and difficult, but I it is something it. like you're saying. Please, something that it, I'm please, please send it to me first. Please send yeah. it to me first. My friend Riley Ellis, who's one of the heroes of this little story we, of, of my career and Shane's, and 
She, was, she worked for Joel Silver. She worked for Chuck Gordon. She was really important in the pad of guys becoming uh, successful. And she has, a, um, she has a cabin up at Idlewild. And I, I long to just say, Riley, can I have the keys for the weekend? And just go up there by, your, by myself and just spend two days up in the woods and regurgitate on paper, whatever, into a laptop, whatever it is. And at the end of those two days, if I have something great, and then I can keep going and finish it. You know, you know that that sounds like a great place to wrap don't, up. Uh, don't, you know, yeah, don't say you got to take three or you know three months or four months. Just do it quickly, and 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 then you can rewrite it. Out, outline, follow your passion, and just get it done at exactly. the end of the day. Exactly. Wow. Well, don't overthink it. I don't know, Lucas. This has been terrific, hasn't it? <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, look, I'm sweating like Nixon. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, congratulations. Yeah, no, no, but I, it's good to see yeah. you. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, you just miss people. We're out in the suburbs. There was COVID. I just haven't seen you. Well, it's good yeah. to see you guys, too. Yeah. Yeah. More than anything, this has been a great chance to kind of catch up. And, yeah. and thank you. Thank you for doing that. All right. All right. So I guess we're, we're all three going to. I'm sorry, what? Is it send me stuff? Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. Some, sometimes I don't know if um, I'd love to send you stuff. Sometimes I don't know if it's welcome. Or not. My door is open. Yeah. Then cut to email. I was just saying that. Oops. Well, I have a friend, I have a dear friend who's a, who's a pretty big writer. And he sent me this pilot that he just did of a very, very famous IP from the 30s. And I haven't read it yet. And I feel terrible. So, yeah. sent, if you, I, so my door is open. But when I get it, I don't know when I'll get to it. Today. Oh, wait, I want to say one thing, because I because we were talking about like the theme, the yeah. theme that I found I was writing like eight times in a row was Faust. Oh, that's what I found. I, I was writing a story of a guy who could have anything he or she wanted, but just had to become a horrible person. And would they do it or not? I wonder how that reflects your psyche and why. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Being, being bullied as a kid or seeing how people avoid being yeah. bullied, maybe. I like it. The one of those the terrible dark. trips. One of those yeah. terrible yeah. trips I wrote in co uh, in college before before I got my agent was actually called "The Man Who Had Everything." Hmm. So great minds, Lucas. Great minds. All right. So we're all three going to sign off. It's been like ninety minutes, and I'll get this posted. And uh, I want to thank Fred. I want to thank Charlie and and our audience. And I will go ahead. Now that we have our special guest, I'm going to go plug this in social, and I hope people find it. And we're going to try and do this uh, with more writers, and more industry people, and we'll hopefully circle back to you, and uh, Fred. And um, thank you. Thanks for for doing our pilot. Thanks yeah, for having me. Okay. It, it was a ball. Take care. Have a good Fourth of July, everybody. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye.